I think uh, what the the crisis period has taught a lot of people is that uh, you know there has been uh, many mistakes done at, at larger banks, larger institutions, and even smaller ones um, as it relates to underwriting and credit of uh, their loan portfolios. Um, a big reason why many big banks uh, and even smaller ones didn't do so well is just uh, related to a broader economic collapse from housing in particular. And so a lot of banks are you know, very active in the housing market. In fact, if you look at bank housing finance, it started you know, even as far back as like the Carter administration, which uh, you know, put forth policies to encourage home ownership and lending for just like any sort of excess or bubble, there was bound to be a sort of reversion to a mean or a reversion to sort of a more normalized level. And so that came about pretty... Uh, aggressively and harshly and caught many people unaware, um, partly because they were doing very well in the good times. You know, when you were lending uh, money at, at, uh, at ever-increasing rates and also uh, to people who couldn't afford to pay, but you were able to always use the collateral as a sort of a backstop against that, and the collateral was increasing in value, which it was for many years before the collapse came, and then it actually turned out to be a pretty good situation for a lot of these banks. Well, I think there's a need for those products because they provide um, uh, a source of liquidity and capital for many types of institutions. Um, the fact is, I think to what you're referring to is securitization, for example. Securitization is a very um, active and useful way for many banks to gain liquidity because they're able to sell off certain loans. Securitization, the concept is basically... And again, in our work, we don't really even cover any of these things because we work with much smaller banks, which kind of follow the model that you alluded to earlier, which is a much more simple model. Um, but securitization in a very simple way is that you originate to sort of sell products to investors. So you originate a loan or originate a product not to hold it until maturity and collect the payments from the borrower, mm -hmm. but you actually originate it to sort of sell it into these pools uh, which have a market because there's people who want to buy into them and who want to you know, invest in them for returns. So you can see why uh, that market actually provides cash to banks uh, looking, to, you know, looking to do those activities and another source of returns. Um, but you know, stepping back for a moment, there's a lot of risk management that goes into those sort of models. And a lot of banks kind of went away from... Uh, sort of the simple formula that kind of worked into this very exotic thing that was very difficult to manage. Um, and the top 10 banks control over 60% of the total assets of the banking system. Okay. So that gives you a sense of two things, really, that there's concentration of assets by size, but there's also a trend towards consolidation. So in the United States, we have more than 7,000 community banks, more than 7,000 banks, period, banks and thrifts. Um, in no other country, even in Europe or in Asia, comes even close to that. And part of the reason is the U.S. banking system has been deregulated ever since the Glass-Steagall Act yeah. um, and subsequent legislations, too, which have basically encouraged the growth of small banks to cater to their local communities. And this gets into why, you know, why they've come about, because in a democratic system with a democratically elected Congress, et cetera, et cetera, um, there is a need for... Um, catering to your constituents and catering to specific communities. And in fact, when those communities are not able to get a loan from a Bank of America or a Citigroup or a Wells Fargo, um, they trust their local community bank to do that. And the community bank then becomes very important to the community, very important to the politicians that write the laws that support their existence in the first place. Um, and, it, and it goes from there. So, uh, you know, there's a concentration of the assets um, it's trending towards more consolidation because of a couple other factors that I'll mention in a moment. But you know, one of them is just increased regulations, and, and it's harder to survive as a bank yeah. that's really small today. There's a scale issue. There's efficiency issue. Uh, but at the same time, uh, certain smaller businesses can provide products and services that and other, other guys can't. Yeah. And yeah. especially in banks, which is one of the most regulated industries, um, you can see how they would be protected by local politicians and local sort of, um, you know, 
yeah. administration is an interest yeah. to sort of keep them going. Yeah. I think it's going to be brought on by the fact that it's just very difficult to survive in today's environment um, as a very small institution. Now, there's a need for those products and there's a need for sort of those kind of banks, but you know, there's certain flexibility of terms, for example, when they extend loans. There's certain, so you know, even deposits like uh, there's, you know, there's the ability for them to actually give you a higher maybe deposit rate because they're looking for deposits versus for Bank of America, it's very easy to get those deposits. Um, so it's hard to say. I mean, the, the consolidation trend has both pros and cons yeah. for it. But I would say, to be honest with you, that the cons and, or the pros for consolidation are outweighing uh, kind of the merits of, of having these small banks around. Okay. And that's a real reason for a lot of investment activity and interest in the sector, too. So a couple of things, you know, we always start with the management team and we always start with sort of the leadership of the institution. And we want to look for people who have a significant insider ownership in the bank to begin with. So they already own a lot of stock, for example, and their interests would be aligned yeah. with investors. Um, that's always an important kind of starting point. Um, the other thing we'd like to see is, um, you know, a big driver of any bank's revenues and earnings and what have you is just, you know, net interest income. So the rate environment. So a big question that we're asking banks today is sort of how do you navigate the rate environment? Do you have procedures and policies in place that um, beyond just sort of hedging or whatever, um, that your balance sheet is is uh, sort of rate neutral on assets and liabilities? And there's a whole complex things that goes around that, but just basically saying that from a rate position, this sort of bank is not super, super exposed to when rates eventually go up. So a big thing today is that we're basically living in a zero interest rate environment, uh, which, can, which can be good for banks, but it's still kind of tough for them to operate in this environment because the loan growth is still not there. Um, and that's because of there's, a, you know, there's some headwinds, economic headwinds, and people are not... It's easy to get deposits today, right? Um, because people are fleeing you know, riskier assets and they want to just put part of their money in the banks, um, even if they pay 0% interest. You know, they're still willing to do it because it's safe. But on the earning assets or the loan side, it's very difficult for them to find, you know, those sort of things. The other thing I would mention and that we're really particular about is just credit underwriting and credit standards and credit quality. So a big reason, to, just going back to the crisis, is didn't have the right people kind of thinking about them or, you know, didn't have the right kind of framework to think about them. Um, and so I would, I would mention that's, a, that's another thing, too. You know, I think one area that's going to really drive it is, is going to be the government expenditure side of the GDP. Um, and the government's already done quite a bit through this crisis in both fiscal and monetary sides of things. Uh, but there's a lot of projects that are shovel-ready, that are bridges, that are infrastructure that can definitely get going and that can probably, you know, help things. Um, where the economy is today is a very, very difficult kind of situation. Um, I don't know how much more room, uh, sort of, uh, like monetary policy-wise, people have to play with. In fact, there's not much room at all to play with. As I said, uh, zero interest rates, and you know, the Federal Reserve has been kind of pumping money, even since the interest rates have been zero, through a variety of different programs. That, um, so, I think there's, it falls then on the backs of fiscal policy, the TARP program. You know, this has gone on for a long time. Uh, most people don't realize, but taxpayers have already made money on TARP. So the dollar that they put in on TARP, has, they're already ahead of that dollar that they put in. And this is, you know, while TARP was initiated at kind of a crisis stage for one industry, it shows that smart government programs can come into play and can have some private partnership and can make money for people. Um, and TARP. Folks are going to make money on this new program called Small Business Lending, which is kind of a replacement for TARP, but it has some different terms, but it's another kind of thing for small community banks, et cetera, to do. Um, but through it all, I would just, I would say that if the folks in D.C. can reach decisions that are clear and actually just reach the decision as opposed to saying, you know, whether the tax rate is 37 percent or 34 percent, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I think it's, you know, we've reached a decision, this is what the rule is going to be, and this is how it's going to play out, and the markets will respond positively to that sort of thing, as opposed to the uncertainty. So that's the big thing, that there's been too much uncertainty, and it's, you know, it's hurting a lot of people.
one or two points on this because I've been following the news quite a bit and um, you know where we live is not too far from where the fires happen but uh, two things kind of come to my mind here um, there's definitely a role for um, as a new business or new idea somebody needs to develop a better way to combat wildfires um, on two two specific things one is getting the alerts to people uh, before the fire comes to their door. It actually sounds like a stupid and kind of easy thing or, you know, just send the alert. But it turns out that over 25 people were killed in these fires, and most of them are all over the age of 60, 55 to 60. Actually, the median age was like 55 to 60 in Carter Springs. And it turns out that not only did they receive the warnings late, but they were the kind of people that have been in their houses for five or six generations. So they've raised their kids, they've raised their grandkids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we need to find a reach, we need to find a way to reach those people better, more effectively, and uh, sort of get them in safe places or, or you know, do that in the first place. But even before that's the case, we need to find a better treatment or sort of way to combat the fires. And what they've used, what they used this whole past month and a half has been uh, this product called Red Slurry. And Red Slurry is, um, a chemical compound which destroys trees and poisons waters and kills fish, actually. And that's, that, that's, the, that's the chemical that's, that they were dispersing? That's the chemical that they have been dis dispersing um, over the past two months. Um, everybody knows it. The, the uh, FDA, Food and Drug Administration, knows about this. The, you know, all the sort of um, you know, government authorities know about it. Even all the people on the ground know about this. So... Uh, but there's just no uh, additional way or no other kind of uh, you know option available at this point in time to do it uh, to you know to handle this issue. So you're talking about a you know 200,000 acre natural forest, one of the most beautiful forests in this country.